Let me. The first thing I'd like to do, just so I can get it on tape, is just to have me give you your, your name first and last in the spelling, and I can set my audio levels at the same time. Okay, my name's Tom Berg. B E R G. That's how you spell my last name. Where did you grow up? Aberdeen, Washington. Oh, a harbor boy. Yeah. And and I assume you wanted to get out of Aberdeen, or did you like Aberdeen? No, I just had to do something when I graduated, and I my all my forebears were in merchant marine, but uh, the American merchant marine. I think was unionized, and I was trying to get on a Norwegian ship. And uh, there was a Danish ship in the harbor that was interred by the U.S. government. And they weren't going anywhere. It took them a couple years to convert it to U.S. flag. The next best is the Navy. So I went down to the Navy recruiting station and, and uh, signed up with them before I would, would be drafted. They weren't drafting 17-year-olds yet, or 18. So I got in the Navy instead. They were glad to have me. <laughs> and what year was that? 1940. And I graduated in June of 40. And uh, all they were accepting then was six-year cruises, which is too bad, because right after I got in, they started this kiddie car cruise. If you went in at 17, you could get out when you were 21. Of course, nobody got out when they were 21, because they were in the middle of the war. But still, you could have gotten out a little earlier, but I had to do my six years. So you'd gone in before Pearl Harbor, then? Oh, yeah. yeah. A year and a half before, in the summer of of uh, 1940. Wow. So were you, uh, like, um, Jonesy went in because of the Depression and there was money and meals and things of that yeah. sort. Was that the reason you got in? or No. My dad was a captain in, uh, on a merchant ship on the Schaefer Brothers, which was a lumber company down there. They had three ships sailing to California ports, carrying lumber from Washington and Oregon ports to California. And uh, well, we weren't hard off at all, but we just wanted to do something. Time to move on. An adventure. Yeah, well, there's a war coming. We knew the war was going to start. And they were drafting, I think, 22-year-olds or something. But, you know, it's coming down every year. And to escape the Army, you join the Navy. So when did you end? Because you ended up on the Tennessee, is that right? Right. Yeah. When did you end up on the Tennessee? After boot camp, they uh, let all of us have, uh, I think, 10 days leave, boot leave. And when we got back down to boot camp in San Diego, they uh, uh, we could sign a preference sheet what we wanted to get into. And uh, my buddy across the street, he graduated a year ahead of me in 1939. And uh, he got on the Arizona. So I signed up for the battleship Arizona. It's the only guy I knew in the Navy. And I, luckily, they did not grant my wish. I'd still be on it. But they put me on uh, a battleship, which was the Tennessee. And I... Uh, after boot camp, they, uh, when, well, we were through with boot camp, they put us on an oil tanker, the Neosho, which happened to be in San Diego Bay. And it took us on a one-way, one-day trip up to Los Angeles where the Tennessee was anchored. So that's how I got on board. And then we were immediately put in the X division or something where new boots, they didn't know where to assign us. And uh, we slept on the steel decks down in the third deck somewhere in some ammunition passageway. And we were told where to go to eat. And uh, I guess somebody tried to catch us once in a while and put us on a work party polishing brass somewhere. But it was largely just getting used to the ship, finding out where everything was and because it was all, well, all battleships are pretty well compartmentized. And 
It's not easy to find your way around when you're brand new on one of those big things. And uh, we were in there, I think, about a, well, maybe a week. And uh, I did get over to San Pedro. Uh, my dad happened to be in port at that time. And mother wrote me letters telling where dad was. And I found him at a union meeting somewhere in, in San Pedro. And uh, so we had a afternoon and evening together and I went back to the ship and <clears throat> and uh, then we left Los Angeles and went to Bremerton Naval Shipyard to get the gaussing cables put around the perimeter of the ship. That's anti-magnetic mine stuff and other repairs and we were in uh, Bremerton and that was in uh, last of November, 1st of December. And they were in a cold snap. Gosh, it was 20 degrees out there or something. And, and the ship was cold. We were sleeping on right on the deck. And we were supposed to be in hammocks. So we just spread our hammock out that we had from boot camp. And uh, it was mighty cold sleeping. But some master at arms found us down there sleeping on the deck. And he didn't like that. He said that. You'll not sleep on that deck anymore. You sleep on a hammock. Trice it up like everybody else did. I was scared stiff of the hammocks. And uh, so the first night we tied the hammocks up and I put lines back and forth underneath that thing in case I fell out, I'd catch myself on these ropes. Cause <clears throat> One of the guys did fall out of the hammock the first night and broke his collarbone. So he was in the sick bay for a while on a little better type of bunk. <laughs> but any, I think uh, January sometime they were through with the shipyard, went back down to Los Angeles Harbor. And I think my dad was back down there by then and had a, another couple of visits with him. And uh, then the ship uh, left for Pearl Harbor. And we spent, <coughs> spent uh, until July sometime in Pearl Harbor. We'd be in port about a week and then we'd go out to sea for 10 days and go somewhere and they were bombarding islands, firing broadside. And, practicing anti-aircraft, and they had other airplanes buzzing us to give us anti-aircraft practice. And, and I was assigned to an anti-aircraft gun mount, a three-inch uh, 45, and uh, found out what how loud those things can be. And, and uh, when they did broadside firing the main battery, the big 14-inch rifles, they would take us and put us on the other side of the ship, away from whatever direction the main battery was firing. And uh, yeah, I think the first time they fired that thing had been maybe a couple years, because uh, it just shook all the soot out of the, out of the two stacks. I mean, these soot flakes are huge. They just blew up in the air because they had the four strap blowers going wide open. And this soot settled down everywhere. It just like we were coaling ship or something. It's just black soot everywhere. We were in white, white shorts and skivvy sh uh, shirts because it was, you know, down the equator somewhere, real hot. And uh, you See, the next time they fired, they told us to put our hand over our ears and open our mouth wide. And when they fired, scream. And that equalized the pressure from the concussion of the guns. And uh, you could tell the, the ship moved about three feet because we were sitting on the deck in the soot. But we scraped the soot for about three foot path when the ship uh, recoiled from the uh, discharge of the main battery. 
and the firing of the those big guns. Oh, it was pretty wild. That must have been a thrill. I mean, that figuring yeah. out how how much is a ship supposed to rock and yeah. shimmy when you fire those <coughs> things the first time. Well, it was just a a jolt. It wasn't any shimmy or a rock or anything. Just the ship heaved sideways during that jolt. Maybe they had too much powder in those <laughs> guns. I don't know. Twelve of them going off at the same time. Wow. It, it was it was something. And uh, well, you want to continue the yeah. That's for, I'll oh. interrupt if, if. Well, in the every, like the routine was a week or so in port and. Uh, and uh, 10 days something out at sea doing just all kinds of naval uh, battle drills, depth charge and general quarters all the time. And, and uh, in uh, July, I think it was, I was in, uh, when we were in port, we could, uh, the Navy was great on uh, sports and they encouraged everybody to get into boxing or baseball teams. And I, I finally found out that that was smart to do because then you got off the ship to take your team, go somewhere and play baseball or something. And, but I got on the uh, junior whaleboat team. And a whaleboat is a 33-foot 30, double-end boat with uh, eight oarsmen, four on each side, and a coxswain. And uh, we'd, we'd row just to get in practice so we all could row together and synchronize our rowing. And so we could do, you know, get the boat up to speed because you had uh, intramural contests between boats, between ships when they were in port. That was a big thing as the whaleboat crew. The junior whaleboat was everybody with less than a year in service. They were a class, and then the other was uh, whaleboat crews from the first division or the boiler division or whatever. And uh, so that that was a thrill, and we were pretty good, I guess, because we got a medal for it. We won something, some kind of a medal. But the other part was get up 5.30 in the morning to get in our whaleboat, and we'd... Uh, when we thought we were good enough, we'd just row over to the landing at Aia and uh, tie the boat up, and we went hiking up in the up in the sugarcane fields and found a reservoir, and we go swimming, <laughs> freshwater swimming reservoirs, and then come back down to the boat and uh, row back to the ship and pretend we'd been rowing all day. <laughs> But it got got us off the ship, and it was delightful to be up in the sugar cane fields, and and you could see the rest of the harbor. We watched these uh, huge Pan American Clipper uh, flying boats coming in and taking off, and they they were something to watch how they would land so smoothly, and and uh, but anyway, we'd row past all the other cruisers and some of the old derelicts. The the old Olympia was there, I think. It was uh, one of the, I don't know if it was Dewey's flagship in the Philippine uh, War, and Spanish-American War was anchored somewhere, and we rode around that and looked at it, the old relic. Of course, it was only about 40 years old then. <laughs> but anyway, in the summer of uh, 1941, uh, they sent us back to... San Francisco, I guess for shore leave or something, get back to the States. And uh, during our trip back, <clears throat> it takes about 10 days to get back to the States. They were going to do full power trials and get the ship up to 22 knots. And uh, so everybody in, uh, well, in June of uh, 1941, I got transferred to the boiler division. And the ship had eight boilers, and there's a hundred some people in the division, and there's about eight people in uh, every fire room during general quarters. 
to man all the burners and so forth. And then the other uh, boiler division were water tenders, uh, boiler makers, and uh, people that had to attend the blower rooms and I guess other, other parts of the other duties of the boiler room. But anyway, one night we were coming up to speed at midnight, supposed to be doing 22 knots. And what I heard was there was a, a fruit boat, a banana boat, it was going the opposite direction without lights. And uh, our ship challenged them, thinking it might be a German raider or something, I guess. There's all kinds of rumors. And this banana boat wouldn't respond. And uh, so our ship uh, put some big searchlights on it and requested identification, and it just kept sending back freighter by uh, this light semaphore system, Morse code, because it was middle of the night. And <clears throat> so our ship did 180 to give chase, and luckily all the boilers were lit up, so we, could, we were just co uh, gradually coming up. They measure shaft torque and all this stuff during the full power trials and, and the fuel consumption and a lot of scientific work going on when they're coming up to full speed to grade the efficiency of the ship. Anyway, we did 180 to give chase to the ship and they had uh, the battleship had these big 42 inch arc searchlights up on the, half, on the platform halfway up on the main mast and any three of them could bear on one target. The fourth would be blind. And they lit up the whole ocean with those things and lit up this ship and fired a shell across the bow of this thing. And uh, about the same time, number five fire room wasn't watching their water close enough and the, the feed water in the steam drum got too high and sent a shot of water through the main steam line into the main number one turbo generator. And any kind of water in those turbines just fried all the blades, just ruined the whole thing. So we shut down and they had to secure boilers and you can only do 16 knots on one engine one turbo generator. It supplies electricity for the four motors that drive the four propeller shafts. And so they naturally just gave up the chase and <laughs> the banana boat got away. But we went, uh, went into San Francisco Bay and had to go into Hunter's Point uh, uh, shipyard to get a bunch of Westinghouse technicians there to lift the casing up from this main, it's a huge affair, and lift the rotor out and take all the blades, which are this size down to that size, many, many stages, clean them all out and reblade the whole turbine. So we were there two weeks <laughs> doing that, and that, that was our shore leave. <laughs> and, uh, during that time, I was put on mess duty, so I couldn't get home. Nobody would take my job. Mess duty was horrible on that particular ship. It was an awful lot of work. You had 20 men to feed. You had to go set the tables, get all the dishes and everything out of the scullery, set everything up, go up to the galley, several trips getting the various uh, parts of the diet, the menu, and by the time they were all through, it was time to stack everything away, take all the dirty dishes up to the scullery and after you washed them, take all the dirty stuff and put all the tables back up. And all this had to be done in a certain time. You never had time to eat. And that, that was the worst duty I think I've ever had. And uh, when we got back out to Pearl, they, uh, one of the chiefs in the division was trying to get a boiler division whaleboat crew together and he found out I had been on the junior whaleboat 
He said, if I put you on whaleboat crew, said, uh, would you mind being, uh, I'll take you off of mess duty and put you on compartment cleaner. And you can clean the compartment anytime, but when you're not on the whaleboat, <laughs> practicing out there, pulling that oar. And I said, well, I'd do anything to get off there. Yeah, I'll take that, <laughs> of course. <laughs> it gave me what I wanted. So that's how I got off. Instead of two months, I had one month of mess duty. That saved my life back in the whale boat. And I also had mess duty in the chief's quarters. They had uh, 88 chief petty officers on the ship at that time. It, the whole ship was over complimented. They just emptied boot camp after boot camp and all the ratings coming up on the, these battleships to get all these guys with sea duty and experience for all the new construction that was coming up. But they had to get the men trained as fast as they were building ships. But anyway, in the chief's quarters, there was 88 of them, and it, that was about twice what we should have, so there was two sittings. So they needed more help with mess boys in the, that was pretty easy duty. All you do is ask each chief what he wanted from the menu and go to the pantry and, and get a plate of whatever he wanted or bowl or whatever, take it to him, go to the next guy. And they, they lived in pretty good luxury. I, they had all the condiments there were ever invented in a drugstore or, or grocery store in the middle of the table, all the sauces and spices, everything there. And, but uh, three meals a day, we'd uh, serve all the chiefs and take all the dishes somewhere. We didn't have to wash them. There's some, some other scullery did that. And... Uh, we slept in the chief's quarters at night after 10.30, after the movies, whatever the chiefs had to get out. And uh, we had cleaned up the place, get ready for the next morning. But uh, we just slept right there on the, on the chairs or the tables. So that was quicker than trying to find our hammock and stuff in our regular, in my case, the boiler division. <clears throat> so that lasted a couple hours, and uh, but I could uh, leave in the morning and go pull my whale boat. And when I came back for whatever meal was ready, I'd join the rest of them. I think I was supposed to be just compartment cleaner there too. So that was pretty easy duty. And that was the same thing. We, we'd uh, go whale boat pulling when we're in port. And then they'd secure the boat when we went out to sea, of course. And you just do regular old mess duty then, which was pretty easy duty. And that's the way it was until December, December 5th, Friday. We were in port. We'd been in port 10 days. And the scuttlebutt was that we were going to be leaving port Friday. And all of a sudden, we heard it was canceled. And of course, the first class and chief petty officers loved that. They could go ashore on Liberty. And we could only get Liberty till 10 o'clock, I think, something like that, or on your, on your Liberty night, which is about one out of three something. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, for some reason, the leaving port was canceled and we were told to clean up the boiler room and the uh, bilges for admiral's inspection and take off the manhole plates that led down to the double bottoms for admiral's inspection. And I'd never heard that before. But of course, I only been in the boiler division about six months. But anyway, take all the nuts off this big plate 
It's a big manhole. You pull the plate off and set it to one side so they could look down or get in there, whoever the admiral's inspecting party was. And the chief water tender, or the first class in charge of the fire room, thought we needed to paint the subway, which is a stairway that goes two decks up to the top of the boiler room where there's an airlock. You got two doors to get into the boiler room. You open one and close it and get open the next one so you don't lose air pressure in the boiler room. The boilers rooms are under air pressure to feed air, combustion air into the boilers. <clears throat> and when we were painting aluminum paint, everything is aluminum. Uh, the, the walls and the ceiling in this, we call it the subway. It's a steep stairway, essentially, or ladder way. Uh, I hadn't finished uh, Saturday night, so I knew Sunday morning I had to get back down there and finish that thing for Monday morning when the Admiral came for his inspection party. And uh, Sunday morning, December 7th, I wanted some fresh air, so I went topside and I walked clear around the perimeter of the ship in a beautiful morning, as usual. Bright sunshine and the water is blue and a little bit of breeze coming in from the sugarcane fields, uh, Aia area on across the harbor. And I noticed they had painted the decks battleship gray sometime the day or two before, because usually it's white teak decks. And they scrubbed them every day with sandstone and holy stone. But they had painted the decks dark blue, some kind, and I noticed there was dew all over the decks, and I had footprints all around the deck where I had been walking. And I thought that probably wouldn't go over so well with somebody, and I just better get lost. So I was coming down the, the break of the foredeck down to the, the main deck, and I saw, I know now it was a Japanese Zero or a Japanese plane coming out of a dive and pulling up over toward the IE of the back end of our ship past the Arizona, which was right in back of us. I, I didn't think too much about that because I was more afraid of my footsteps, I think. And uh, I thought it must be a Army Air Force training or something, but those big red circles on the wings look kind of funny, odd. Anyway, I went down uh, one more deck down to my where the boiler division sat. I was on the port side of the ship, and uh, West Virginia was anchored outboard of us. <clears throat> we didn't like that because we like to be the outboard ship because then you can look out the porthole and see what's going on out in the water and you get the breeze and so forth. If there's a ship next to you, you know, 10 feet away, it cuts down the ventilation and that. So I went back down and to uh, my division and uh, along the side of the ship, there's a big space where you put all the hammocks and uh, uh, second, first class petty officers on above, they get a camp cot and they have to try set up and their bedding is uh, in a big bag, but uh, we were in uh, hammocks. You have to sling them up between the hooks and the, the deck beams and you have to lash them up and they're folded a regulation way, of course, but all of these are stowed in the hammock nettings in the particular storage, but alongside this is a bench. And I sat on that bench. It's a, you know, pretty long with the length of the compartment and what, just guys are playing uh, AC Ducey on the deck and mess cooks are finishing up, putting the tables up, slinging them up between the beams. And 
just clearing the deck. And uh, a clarinet player, from, I knew it was 8 o'clock, coming close, and the, the band uh, is on the fantail preparing to play the national anthem to raise the flag. It's the very regulation ship. Well, all the battleships were. And this clarinet player comes charging through the compartment, and he's got uh, regulation shorts and a, and a T-shirt. He says, the Japs are bombing us. And he just screaming as he runs through to alert all the rest of the compartment, the divisions running, running up forward through the ship. And uh, nobody knew what the heck was the matter with this guy. He may have been a little gone off his rocker or something. And about the same time, the West Virginia outboard got a couple torpedoes or one. I don't don't know how one torpedo could could uh, hit a ship that hard, but it banged into our ship with enough force it just boosted me right off of my where I was sitting on this bench. I landed on my feet out in a compartment, and uh, we had a big uh, conveyor belt trunk running through our compartment, and uh, here this thing is rumbling, and because uh, it's I don't know the it's all enclosed, it couldn't see what's in it, but but I never heard that thing rumbling before. It only rumbles during general quarters and we're never in that compartment. We're down in the boiler rooms or something. But here this thing is rumbling. I guess they're hauling shells up topside to the anti-aircraft guns. And uh, nobody is saying anything. They just all, or we're all bewildered by this. It's gotta be something big to have jarred our ship that hard. And uh, so we run over to walk over to where the hatch is to get down into the engineering spaces. And uh, there's mill, uh, people milling all over this thing. And you only go down one at a time. And they're waiting their turn. And another big jolt hits. And uh, a lot of people fell, fell to the deck. And I had other people to bounce against. <clears throat> and, uh, and big concussions and so forth. And then you, the anti-aircraft gun to start firing. You could hear them already firing away, and uh, we knew something was really off when, because they never fire a gun in port. And we finally get back, uh, get down the hatch, and get down to my particular fire room, and uh, and every. Everybody, most of the people are there also, and they all come down. And uh, we got orders to light off the, light the boiler off. And the first thing you have to do is uh, open the drain valve to drain the feed water out of the steam drum. Steam drum's a thing about so big around. And it's filled to the top to prevent any corrosion or rusting inside the steam drum. You, when you're through firing, you know, it's full of water, and nothing can rust. But you have to drain the water down halfway to where the sight glasses are to see where the water level is before you can light the burners. And the, the burners, when they kick in, they heat the water, and the water expands, and the water level comes up. So you got to watch this and keep draining it. Well, there's only one boiler online in port, and there's seven others of us draining at the same time. And these drain lines are not equipped to drain seven boilers at the same time. So we're sitting there waiting for this water level to come down and keep we talking to boiler control. They're the ones that tell every boiler room how many burners to have on. You can't get the water down. It's we presume there, all the boiler rooms are emptying at the same time and the lines are full and uh, can't drain that fast. They're probably only sized to drain one or two boilers at a time. So he said, break a joint in the drain line and drain your boiler into the bilge. And so we did, got the wrenches out, undid the bolts and nuts and broke a line and 
flooding the bilges with the water and it came down pretty fast then. And then we could light the boiler. And in the meantime, we're hearing all the gun firing going on, and, but uh, we got all six burners going and the uh, force draft blower is going and the, when all the, boiler, the burners are going and the force draft blower on, you can't hear anything in the boiler room. It's, yeah, they can be firing anything, you can't hear it. You can throw a bucket across the room, you can't hear it. And uh, the, uh, I think we were just uh, about that time the Arizona blew up because there was a tremendous concussion and uh, the smoke, uh, the concussion blew all the smoke down the stack into our boiler and the fire and everything came out of the burners about from here to the wall there, this far out. And the yellow acid smoke just filled the whole room and uh, the guys are lying on the floor coughing and hacking and spitting trying to get this this sulfur smoke out of their lungs and uh, we immediately opened the force draft blower wide open to force all of this stuff back in the burners and up the stack and uh, I was a JV talker I had uh, phones on that was my duty to, uh, in phone contact with the uh, we're, we are in contact with uh, one of our boiler division men that's stationed as a smoke watch he's up on the navigation bridge and he watches the smoke stacks there's two big smoke stacks and they're divided into quarters so we can tell which of the eight boiler rooms are smoking and he tells which one is smoking and what to do to knock off the smoke. But uh, I talked to him and also main boiler control. And uh, so I didn't have to be down there with the burners. I went up the subway, uh, far up as I could get where the air was reasonably clear. So I didn't have this breathe that crap down in the boiler room. <clears throat> so I wasn't affected by that. But uh, I was talking all the time to this smoke watch up topside and he's telling me all the horrors, talk, telling everybody, all of the fire rooms, what's going on up there. Uh, the West Virginia has been torpedoed and it's sinking. Going down, there's fires on it. The, West, the Arizona blew up and it's all in flame. He can't see that because of the fire and the smoke and fire is blowing on our ship and He's starting to gag. He can't stand the smoke from the Arizona. And uh, oil from the Arizona is flooding around our ship on the, on the surface of the water, and it's all burning. The back end of the ship is burning from the fire, and it, it did completely scorch the whole inside of the ship. All the officers' country are back aft. It, no fire, it just heat scorch the insides, the paint and the wireways. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and luckily my violin was in the band room on the third deck, which is below the water line. So everything down there was safe and secure. It was everything up above was, was uh, pretty well burned up. I mean, scorched heat, heat ruined. There wasn't any fire. Anyway, uh, uh, this guy is telling me about the o Oklahoma turning over and uh, Maryland got a bomb forward and she's flooding to kill any fires. She, they're flooding the front end of the ship forward and the stern is coming up. He thought it was going down. And uh, finally, I guess he couldn't take the smoke up there anymore. And so he left and it had no more communication with what was going on out there. And I started suspecting the worst. Gosh, maybe our ship's tipping over and I can't tell because I'm down here in this hole. So I got a piece of string and I found a file and I tied it on there and I tied the string up on a catwalk on the upper level in the boiler room and that's my plumb bob. And I marked it on the deck that 
that's where the ship is now. I'm going to see if it's tipping. And if it started to move, then I knew the ship was starting to, to tip. Maybe we were tipping over too, capsizing. <clears throat> but uh, nothing was wrong with our ship except it got uh, two bomb hits, one forward on number two turret, right in the middle of the center rifle. There's three rifles in each turret. And this bomb hit forward right on the center of the middle rifle and detonated. And the shrapnel went up into, took all the windows out of the pilot house and the nav bridge and a, an aircraft gun mount up above that. And my buddy from when I was on the aircraft, anti-aircraft uh, division, he was killed, one of five on the ship. And uh, one of those fragments from that bomb also went over to the bridge of the West Virginia where Captain Benyon, captain of the ship was, and it uh, disemboweled him and killed him. He lived for a while. But uh, the, the second bomb hit came down through the main mast and it took a yard arm and the air and aircraft, uh, well, a signal a searchlight platform and hit right on the uh, airplane catapult and uh, hit right on the roof of the turret. And it was a dud, but the weight of that thing was so heavy, the roof of the turret, I think, is four or six inches thick with a, a lap joint with rivets in them. And it broke this seam, just dented the roof of the turret and the bomb broke and the powder went down into the, in the ammunition handling area inside the turret and started a fire, which was contained. But I think there were people injured down there from that. But other than those two bomb hits, uh, uh, our ship was pretty safe. And uh, well, somebody uh, up on the bridge or somebody decided it'd uh, be a good idea to start uh, the propellers running, which we heard pretty early in the, in the game. I thought we were going out to sea because we didn't know anything else. But you could hear the same rumble, the same vibration of the ship. The propellers were going. What they were doing is washing the water and the oil away from the back end of the ship. From the fires of the Arizona, just keep blowing it back. And, uh, and there are some pictures also, uh, war, Pearl Harbor pictures, showing fire hoses squirting water down on on the oil, trying to wash the the flame and the oil away from the back of the ship. So I guess they used fire hoses and the propellers to wash this oil away from the back of the ship. And I think I was down there all day, and that night they uh, he sent me up topside to main deck to get the uh, we had insulated water canisters to uh, get new water. And uh, so I had to go up the subway and up on the main deck to the, where the scuttle butt, that's a big air conditioned tank that uh, chills water for these little drinking fountains. That was the, there was two decks with drinking spigots. That was the only place you could drink water on the for the crew. They didn't have these little electric uh, refrigerated water things that they got now <clears throat> spread all through the ship. This was uh, one area only. So I had to go up there and there was a faucet to fill up your can jug, bring it back down the fire room for the rest of the crew. And when I went up topside, I peeked outside and it was horrible. It was pitch black. All the lights are out. No lights in the city, nothing. The only lights were a fire on the West Virginia. Something's burning over there. 
the ship was blacked out. You couldn't see what part it was. And the Arizona had a fire on it. I knew which was port and which was aft. And uh, there was hoses, fire hoses, all over the decks. And they were all pulsating. You had to wade through them. And it was pretty horrible. Junk all over the ship. I don't know how, what did that. The lockers had fallen down. And, uh, I couldn't see any reason for any of it, but he filled up my water can and went back down to the fire room and told them how awful it was up there. And... So I think the next morning they secured general quarters and uh, they were down to one or two boilers firing again. They secured the boiler because we weren't going anywhere. The West Virginia had pinned us in against the two mooring uh, keys that the ships tie to. And the Maryland was in front of us and she wasn't going anywhere. And I got put on various working parties. One of them was go back in the officer's country and start chipping paint, which I thought was ridiculous. But went back in uh, <coughs> Admiral's pantry, I think it was, or Captain's pantry. I'd never been there before, of course. But he had uh, little fancy coffee cups and coffee dishes and, and uh, dinner plates and salad bowls, all, some of them were melted, some were all black with soot. They were just horror. They all had to be thrown away, I guess. But everything was charred. There were no lights. They strung portable extension cords and lights all through the area so you could see. But none of the regular lights worked. Everything was burned out. There we are trying to chipping paint off of the ceilings and stuff. and That was just to keep us busy. And I got on another work party. They put us over on the Maryland, the battleship ahead of us. They needed a rope party. It's about 100 men on the deck hanging on a rope. Went through a davit, and they went down to the bottom of the ship where there's a toilet paper locker down there that had been flooded. All the toilet paper was sopping wet. And they pumped the water out, but the wa toilet paper had to be dumped. So they had a big bag of some kind. They fill up and tie it on the rope, and then they'd tell us to march. And we'd go down the deck, and that would pull the toilet paper up the top side, and they'd dump it out. And then we had to come back to put the line back down. We did this for oh, many hours. And then I got on a... I was just wandering around. Uh, yeah, the, the morning after, I went topside, and uh, I, I, the five-inch forty-five anti-aircraft guns had fired so many rounds that the paint on the barrel had melted. It was dripping, hanging like uh, like ribbons of paper and stuff off of the barrel. I couldn't believe how hot that thing must have been to melt all that paint. And their gun, these shell casings, five inch, but you know, that big and this long, littered the deck a couple feet deep. Of course, there's nothing in them, so they were very light. But you had to wade through these things to, to walk anywhere. These, these shells, they'd scoot out from under when you stepped, you kick them aside or whatever. And these guys had been up there, hadn't been relieved. And uh, they were just bleary-eyed and waiting for the next wave to come in. Fortunately, there weren't any more the next day. But there was rumors about Japanese invasion fleet off the coast, and they were coming in. And uh, everybody available was given a machine gun of some kind, and they had them all around the perimeter of the ship. And uh, nobody knew what the heck was going on, whether that was true or false. And I think a couple of days later, they were uh, 
we, we knew we had to dynamite the, the key, the mooring key up forward in order to get our ship out because of the curvature of the hull. And West Virginia sank right next to us, blocked us in. And uh, this key is about 30 foot, 30 foot diameter, irregular shape, and about 10 feet deep, filled with sand to give it a lot of, a lot of weight so a battleship could bounce against it. And uh, so I was in a working party, shoveling buckets of sand and dumping it over into the, into the bay, and right alongside Ford Island where these battleship mooring keys were. Not took half a day to empty that thing, a big gang of guys in there filling up buckets and passing them up, dumping them, <laughs> throwing the buckets back down a lot of fun. So I got through with that one. I just tried to get lost all the time so they wouldn't put me on other work and these nonsense parties. That one had to be done. I found some guys up uh, working on an engine on a motor whale boat. And uh, so I climbed inside the boat with him. I said, what are you doing? And he said, we got to take this engine out of here. And uh, it was burned up or something. And uh, I said, gosh, can I help you? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> so I was working on that thing for a couple hours. And, and darned if I didn't hear my name over the PA system to lay below to something. And, and uh, yeah, I had to get on an oil hose working party. And these, uh, we had to get the oil out of our ship to lighten the ship, so to move it. And that meant get these oil hoses that are hanging in racks around the mainmast. These things are, I don't know, 10 inch diameter with big heavy flanges on the end and they're 10 feet long. And they, they weigh a ton. It takes a gang of guys to carry one. But uh, we had to rig these across the deck of the West Virginia to an oil barge out there to receive our oil and lay these things across the deck and put the bolts and nuts through it, the couple the flanges together and and uh, couple it up to hook it up to that oil barge and and then we were through. But that, that took a, gosh, better part of a day rigging that stuff up. And in the meantime, well, the, the port side of the West Virginia was down in the water, underwater. So we had to, I don't know, we rigged it up somehow with rope so it would be above the water. And the starboard side of the ship was up because she had a list to it. It was above the water line. But you could see these other little, the Liberty boats and stuff going around the harbor, picking up uh, dead people, dead people that had been killed that were floating around the surface of the water. And uh, Wednesday, I think uh, a lot of the bodies started bloating that were submerged and they started popping up. And uh, all you could see was the back of their shirt, their back, just like a pillow floating in the water. The head and the arms would be down and the feet down. They're just floating like a pillow and the boat would come along with a boat hook and try to get them alongside and put a line around them somehow to pull them aboard. And that was pretty gruesome duty because a lot of the bodies fell apart as they pulled them up. But they were taking them over to an emergency burial site over where the ball field used to be, just temporary storage. I don't know, I guess some years later they redid the punch bowl, which I think was a garbage dump until uh, the military changed it into a national cemetery. And all these bodies were eventually taken up there. 
And the 16th of December, we finally, the Maryland was pulled out and so we could get out and we had taken care of that one key. We went over to the shipyard <clears throat> and to get some uh, emergency uh, plates put over the portholes back aft that were all burned out. They had to weld them in and temporary patch on the number two turret, cover that up. And uh, the forward number two turret had been kinked by the bomb hit, but there was nothing they could do with that. I guess they tried to replace some windows up in the pilot house and stuff that was damaged there. And it was a very short uh, time in the yard. But we could get ashore for the first time and walk around the shipyard and see the Ogallala was a mine layer and she was lying on her side, very old ship. And I walked to the, around the big 1010 dock the, where the Pennsylvania was. She was in dry dock and there were two destroyers in dock in front of her, casting in the downs. And one of them was tilted over off her keel blocks. I guess they'd been hit with something. And they were going to flood the dock to float the Pennsylvania out. And there was oil all over the water, of course. The whole bay was oil. And oil came up and made everything black on these two ships. And then they pumped it back down. You could see the exact water line around the ship. It was kind of interesting. Black down below and ordinary uh, gray paint above. Anyway, on the 20, 20th or 21st, we left Pearl Harbor with the Maryland, USS Maryland and the Pennsylvania, the only three ships that could get underway. We were going to Bremerton Naval Shipyard and the Pennsylvania was to go to San Francisco Naval Shipyard. And that was kind of uneventful until uh, we got in a big storm. And that, that was really, the size of those waves in that storm just boggled me. I went up topside to get, you know, to see what the weather was like and all that. And here's this mountain coming towards us. And I just stared stiff. I went right back down <laughs> and hid. I was waiting for the tons of water to come down this hatch. And because uh, the ship had been rolling quite heavily, very slowly because of the size of the ship. But uh, all night long, the, all the camp guys in camp cots had slid on the deck as the ship would roll. And then they'd slide the other way. Nobody was where they were supposed to be. And guys in hammocks like me, we didn't know the difference because we were in pretty good, you know, we were in gimbals. We didn't know the ship was doing anything. But the camp cots, they were all over the place. But anyway, I guess that was the reason why I wanted to see what's going on up there. And anyway, I waited for this ship to get buried by this mountain of water coming, and but it didn't. The ship just rolled with it, and I guess the wave went underneath it. I went up topside again, and uh, and I waited long enough that there was this, another one coming the same way. But the decks weren't wet. This is up on the boat deck, and I it just baffled me. I'd never seen any weather like this. So I went down below again, waiting for the next one. Nothing happened. So the next one, I stayed up there to watch what's going on. And uh, I saw the ship just rolled with it, and the wave went underneath it, and she came over the top. And uh, so the next one, she was starting again. I went over to the side of the ship on an aircraft, an aircraft gun mount and looked down, and here's the bilge keel, and the very bottom of the ship is all bare. 
the ship had rolled that much that it would just bear clear down to the turn of the bilge. And the next wave was coming, but she'd just roll with it. And uh, then I noticed when we're on top of the wave, when the wave's going underneath, there the Maryland was. <laughs> Couldn't see it with the big waves between us. But uh, there was ammunition ready boxes around the ship had been lag screwed into the teak decks. They were ripped off. We lost a lot of those. The airplane on the fantail had been torn off. It was gone. And it was just complete devastation topside from things broken. And uh, early in the morning, I had been put on a work party bailing out the blower rooms. That surprised me. How did all that water get in the blower rooms? Well, the waves were coming over the back end of the ship into the intakes for the the blowers and flooding down these huge trunks and going into the battle bars down into the blower rooms. And the, the These big blowers are big centrifugal fans. They're huge things with a big electric motor. No, a steam turbine. It was steam-driven turbines, and uh, these things are huge, and, but they're up on a pedestal about 10 inches off the deck. So there's six, eight inches of water sloshing around in the room from all the water topside coming in. And you don't want it to get into the, into the fan because that'll blow it down into, make a rainstorm down the boiler room. So we have bucket brigade. You fill up buckets of water and pass it on to a whole gang of people, clear on down until I think they had to take it to the main deck to throw it in one of the heads. <laughs> but there aren't any drains anywhere else. So that kept us busy for, <laughs> I don't know, until they started the ship in a different direction, I guess, so it wouldn't be taking too much. But that was during the night. But anyway, uh, we, I think it was the 27th of December, we were entering, I was on watch in the boiler room. We were entering Straits of Juan de Fuca because the ship was settling down, wasn't rolling so much. We figured we were in the Straits. It was middle of the night, pretty dark, I think. And... I heard this torpedo coming. And I was at uh, Navy Torpedo Station for 12 years, so I know it. I know now what torpedoes sound like, and I heard it then, which I didn't know what they sounded like. But I could tell. You, and standing in the room, I could tell what direction it was coming from, and that was so eerie. And it was a... And it passed right underneath the ship, and I could hear it going out the other direction. And that just scared the life out of me. And then I heard the next one, right behind it. And it did the same thing. It just passed underneath the ship and went out somewhere, out the port side. And then I heard big concussions, depth charges or something going off. And uh, I guess some destroyer, we had destroyers with us, were, I don't know what they were depth charging. I wish they'd been after the sub that fired those things. And, uh, but years later, I read an article by the uh, navigation officer on the Maryland. He told about... Uh, his experience at Pearl Harbor and coming in to the Straits. And uh, there was a scare about a submarine. And the destroyers that were with us uh, dumped some depth charges on something. And he said, probably all we did was kill a bunch of whales. And I wrote a letter back to him that... Uh, that was not just a 
depth charging whales. I said, we had two torpedoes pass under our ship because I heard them loud and clear and somebody was after somebody. What, why, I don't know, or whatever happened. And he never answered me and he's since passed away. Let me, I gotta interrupt just for a second. I gotta know what's going on. So, so that gentleman passed away that, that, uh, from the Maryland. You never met Yeah. Him. He lived in Port Ludlow somewhere south of where I lived. I never met him. But uh, well, we got into port, I think, on the 29th of December. And, of course, my folks and never knew anything about where I was. And I had written a letter to my mother. I put Mrs. T.H. Berg figuring she could figure out territory of Hawaii. I was still in Hawaii. <laughs> of course, her initials are TW. And she thought I was completely gone off my rocker, I found out later. But she still didn't know where I was. But, but we were allowed one airmail letter to tell people stateside that we were OK. And that was my one letter. And it didn't do very well. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we got into port in the Bremerton Naval Shipyard, and I didn't have liberty that night, but the next night I, <laughs> I uh, got ashore and went to the drugstore there on Pacific and called my folks, and uh, they were just leaving the house to go to something in town in Aberdeen. And... Uh, so they changed their plans and came up to Bremerton. And I had to be in back aboard ship by 11 o'clock, I think. So we just sat at the, in the drugstore and the, the soda fountain counter there or got a table and talked until time I had to go back. And, and uh, I think they came up. I had Liberty a couple of days later, and they came up, and I finally got home. And we were, uh, <clears throat> I think we were, we were there till February. And then they did some sea trials and stuff, and we went back down to Los Angeles Harbor. And no, San Francisco Bay. We were tied up along the piers. That was good duty. We could get ashore in San Francisco and I could visit some of my folks' friends in Oakland and see the country and tour San Francisco, which I hadn't seen for a l many years. And uh, so we, every time there was a battle like Guadalcanal, Coral Sea, the battleships would go out to sea, I don't know, about halfway to Hawaii, I guess, and we were the second line of defense. And we did nothing but battle practice and general quarters drills and that stuff. And, and come back into San Francisco and more glorious duty stateside. And uh, until August, we went back to Pearl Harbor. That was the first time I've been there since since we left before. <laughs> I don't know why I get emotional about it. But... I mean, that's very understandable. It was pretty bad to see Pearl again. I think the, the Arizona courts was still there. And uh, fortunately, we were only there uh, a week or something or less. And, they, uh, and we went back to Bremerton Naval Shipyard to get completely rebuilt. We got in back into Bremerton and 
August sometime of 40, 42. <coughs> and I bought an old car and I could uh, go home every other night that I had fire watch. I had to carry a fire extinguisher around and follow a, a welder on my duty nights. <coughs> and uh, then I could go home. So that was pretty nice for until December. And uh, I've been having an out with one of the warrant officers in my boiler division. And he was trying to get me uh, sent off to new construction on the East Coast. And uh, I told my mother that I was slated to go to East Coast for a new cruiser or something. And I said, gosh, there's a lot of guys there from New Jersey that wanted that kind of get transfer. And me, I'd like to go home every other night. And she wrote a letter to the captain or to the either the captain or the Lutheran minister of in Bremerton who went to see the captain about this inequity of me getting sent back east when other guys could do it. I got called up to the captain or the executive officer and asked, uh, he was nice and quiet about it. He said, uh, we got a letter here uh, about your being transferred to the East Coast and you'd just as soon not because there are other people from the new coast East Coast that would just as soon be sent there. He says, yes, sir, that's true. He said, could you give me some names? So I gave him some names and, the, and that was it. And uh, the warrant officer didn't know about this. But he saw there was a substitution, so he put me down again to get rid of me. And the same thing happened. I had my bag out there in front, mustered up with the transfer party and the yeoman had come out there last minute and he says, bird, fall out. <laughs> and uh, somebody else taken your place. And this guy was pretty upset about what was going on. And he said, I'm going to get rid of you one way or another. And I said, well, you just try it. I was being <laughs> flipping his lid. And... Uh, so he finally came up to me and he says, I, I don't know what's going on here, he says, but I'd like to see you get something else off of this ship. <laughs> and he says, I'll, I'll give you, I had put in for second class uh, machinist mate, which he wouldn't give me either. <clears throat> I'll give you second class machinist mate if you'll take a billet at the submarine school in New Lennon, Connecticut. And I said, well, I have to check with my mother on that submarine school. She may not like that. <laughs> and, well, let me know in a day or two. So I came back and told mother, I think it'd be a good idea for me to go to submarine school. <laughs> so he, uh, I went back and told him, okay, I'll take that. I get a rating. At least I can start going up the ladder. So he let me, so there was five of us, some, some other cook and a fireman, and they needed back there. We, Christmas Day, we were transferred. I had to leave Puget Sound Naval Shipyard and take a ferry to Seattle and got my train ticket and orders to go to New London, Connecticut, report for submarine school. And so I did. And I went through submarine school, submarine diesel school, and then uh, I hadn't had leave in three years or something, so they gave me 14 days leave, and I got home, and after, that was in May sometime, back to school, and by then they, my, everyone in my class had been assigned to new submarines. I was out of sync, so they put me on a training submarine, an old O-class boat from World War I. And I was on that for a year, and uh, that was just a training boat. They'd take students from, from uh, submarine school and about 15 of my guests on board, and we'd go out 
Long Island Sound and do four dives and come back in at noon and another class and go out in the afternoon and come back with, you know, every day like that. And then I put in for uh, Nave Officer Training Program, V-12 program. And I finally got to the University of Washington where we were sent to Asbury Park, New Jersey for two months of, of pre-V-12 academic training and, and, and the physical exercise to get us in physical shape. And we took English, math, and physics every morning so I could relearn the parts of speech, <laughs> things I had forgotten since high school. And I finally got to the University of Washington in July and started the, or June, sometimes start summer quarter semester. And I was at the University of Washington for five semesters and the war was over with in 1946 and I refused to sign over for two more years after my six year cruise, which was coming up in 46. And uh, so they sent me back to submarines, Mare Island, and I was on three submarines there putting a lot of commission. And uh, then a submarine tender when I didn't have enough time for another decommissioning on the Nereus. And finally, I, September 24th, I was out. They had to let me go. So I came back to the university and, and uh, finished a degree in mechanical engineering on the GI Bill. Graduated in 48. But I was an apprentice seaman for many years. <laughs> Never got very high up in the hierarchy in the Navy. And that was a good reason not to stay in the Navy because everybody else had been in my time in the Navy were chief petty officers by then. My highest rating was second class machinist or motor Mac. So that's about my Navy story. Two, two questions. One, the violin. Did you, did you play f with the, the ships? Yeah. Ship had an orchestra. <clears throat> yes, were... they had a band. A band. Yes, and uh, there were some people played violin, and uh, I don't think there were any other stringed instruments. And they wanted a small orchestra. I guess this was to play for officers, and we were slated one night to play for the officers, and we had gone through waltzes and things, and uh, it never came off. But uh, I practiced with them because the band director wanted to keep every, lots of things going. And I kept my instrument there because I only had a little tiny locker. And that was the only place I could keep my violin. That's why it was there, safe from the fire. And I practiced down in the trunk room, down the bottom of the ship. I, Sundays I had the duty. You know, I couldn't go ashore. I had a duty uh, 8 o'clock watch that night or something. I'd spend the afternoon down in the trunk room playing the violin, going through all kinds of exercises and things, which I did quite often. So I, I found a lot of satisfaction in keeping the violin up. Did, did I hear right that you at one time hawked your violin off because you couldn't have it with you? <clears throat> No, I, I didn't, never hawked it. I had to take it ashore. Oh. They said all wood, there was nothing wood could remain on board. I mean, personal wood. Of course, the decks were wood. And there. But anyway, I had to take it home. And uh, that was uh, after Pearl Harbor, well after. <clears throat> and uh, so we got down to San Francisco. I but walking past the uh, pawn shop, I saw, you know, violins, ukuleles, everything. I uh, looked at this violin in a violin case, cheap thing. It was five dollars, but it was a violin and a bow in a case. I couldn't miss. It had horrible tone. It was absolutely no good, but 
it was the same feel. I didn't care if it sounded at all. So I bought it and sneaked it aboard. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how I really sneaked it aboard, under my peacoat or something. And uh, kept it in the band room. <coughs> and I still played down in the... And I didn't care if they found out about it and burned it up. What's $5? <laughs> But I had something to play. And finally I had to take it home too and I got assigned to the submarine service. There was no place there for it. And I didn't get back to the violin until I was out of the Navy in uh, working in the naval shipyard and I joined the Bremerton Symphony in 1950. That's when I got back on the violin. It was few years there without it. And then the other question, it was interesting because, and I know it's hard to bring some of this back, and you said, I don't understand why I get emotional. Well, it's a pretty major event that happened in, in your life. From the yeah. time that you, because being at Pearl Harbor when it really happened, that had to be, for a lot of people, while well, listening to uh, um, Jonesy talk about it, said it was unbelievable. We did we couldn't be being attacked. <clears throat> no. So there was this surreal aspect. Now you went away and then came back and saw Pearl Harbor, which yeah. you'd already seen. Is that when it became real to you that, that this really had happened? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Because the, the damage, a lot of it was still there. And uh, we couldn't believe going back there. I'd been really would have uh, appreciated being anywhere else. I thought we were going to be attacked again in the same harbor. Because there's no, no defense set up. And I'm quite bitter about uh, Admiral Kimmel and General Short for not being prepared for that attack. They were in charge of the defense of the Oahu, the island. And they had no drills. They didn't have communication between themselves. They had the warning. The destroyer Ward was out there and sank a submarine and reported it an hour and a half before the attack. Nothing was done about it. The radar sighted the Japanese planes coming in. They attributed it to their squadron of B-17s. Well, sure, it was both. The Japanese were coming in our B-17s were flying in, same time. But they should have used these as drills, or had drills without these things. Put the whole place on alert. If they had put 25% of the anti-aircraft guns in state of readiness with loaded ammunition, the output outcome of that Pearl Harbor attack could have been quite different. But there was nothing. All the ammunition is locked in, in the ammunition rooms under padlock. I, I don't understand. They knew a war was coming. We knew it was coming. We had notices on the bulletin board that the talks are breaking down. And uh, we only felt it was a matter of weeks the war was going to start. We didn't know it was coming there, but... They had war games, I understand, in 1934. The gold and the blue teams. One was the enemy, one was the defense. They did the same thing. They came in from the north with airplanes, bombs, and ships. It, it, and the Japanese did the same. They used the same script. It's unbelievable that they weren't prepared for it. Even a, a Sunday, so what? They could have had a drill that the, we are being, going to be attacked and uh, order all the ships to put ammunition in their guns, get ready for it, and just exercise the anti-aircraft. 77 ships in that harbor, and nearly every one of them had anti-aircraft guns on board. If they had had all of their shells in the ammunition ready boxes or loaded in the guns, get ready for it, and then call the drill off, just like uh, any other man overboard drill or, or general quarters. And 
they could have simulated that they're coming in. But here they had the real warnings of a destroyer out there guarding the entrance to the bay. And he sank a submarine. Man, what more real play do you need? And the airplanes coming in, detected by radar and reported to somebody who let it fall through the cracks. Now, I, I, I was really upset with the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association exonerating Kimmel, which the family had been fighting to do this for a long time. But the president said, I wrote him a letter, a blistering letter from me. And everybody in our chapter 10 agreed with me that uh, th this shouldn't have been done. They should be held accountable for that. I don't care how Roosevelt didn't get the message out to the Pearl Harbor in time or whatever it was, that uh, they should be held accountable because there wasn't any preparation at all for it in my mind. I'm not in their shoes. Maybe I'm misjudging everything, but to me, it was a fiasco that could have been nullified to some extent if, if we were prepared with the anti-aircraft guns at least. Even the fighter planes, they could have been, half of the pilots could have been in the ready rooms like they are today. The airplanes could have been in some state of readiness with ammunition loaded in them, ready to go, ready to take off. It was just nothing was done. It was just strict peacetime. That really makes me upset. Something could have <coughs> been improved in that. Are you one under the belief that, that the ships had been unmasked in Pearl Harbor, kind of knowing this was going to happen to get the U.S. into the war? Or do you think it was more like... I, I, I think uh, I don't believe all these... There's books coming out now about the aftermath that uh, we're going to revisionist theories that we were being sucked into this on purpose and they planted the fleet there to get bombed purposely and I could have blamed the open manholes that they wanted the ships to sink better but uh, I don't believe any of that it be, being it uh, false or not it doesn't make any difference I blame not being in a state of preparedness by at least I'm glad the ships weren't in out at sea. They torpedoed us out there. We'd have sunk in mile deep water instead of thirty feet of water. Because you would have been in the same state of readiness. Well, we if I mean, we'd been survive. out at sea, we'd have had the guns manned. Yeah, but they still could have gotten through our air defense, I think, and uh, torpedoed us probably. Have you ever gone back? I mean, not the time when you went back in the Navy, but years later? Oh, yes. I, I, you know, my, I had to go out there on duty many times to check out submarines for, for modifications to submarines and uh, also out at uh, arming uh, nuclear torpedoes and that sort of thing. So I've been out there on business, and then I go out there now on uh, reunions. Yeah. Do we pay due respect? Oh yeah, I go out to the memorial and but there I'm incensed by Japanese that don't understand English, that don't care to listen to the Parks Department people illustrating what's going on and I think people ought to listen to them but the Japs out there, tourists, don't understand English so they don't care what they're saying and they just jabber off to themselves and they're all laughing and having a good time. And not many of them have any empathy or, or uh, respect for what went on. I've heard a lot of people saying, they say, look what we did. They're kind of proud of the fact, maybe, some of them think it's a big joke. And I wish they would segregate them from, from uh, us that go out there to the, I think, the white people and Japanese could go on separate cruises over there or something.
but I've written to the Parks Department to, if we could affect something like that, but no, no, they, everything is open public to anybody. But uh, a lot of them are just plain irrever ir irreverent about it, which is not good for me. But. Do you think there's a, a message to be left from World War II to generations that you know never knew? Yeah, I think all the. Uh, it's the same thing. Even today, it's even worse getting ready for these threats from, I think, worse than a national threat. It's this little insidious Al Qaeda threats. Osama bin Laden and his henchmen and dreaming up, I think, trying to strike terrorism into the country by. Oh, blowing up little things, not little, but symbolic bridges or schools or whatever, if they putting that in. It's a tremendous expenditure of natural, national resources preventing this, or the intelligence that has to be developed to stop this. It's a horrible waste. You know, the lines at the airports, a tremendous amount of wasted talent there because of the threats on airplanes now. It used to be just a hijacker now and then, but now with this international terrorism, it's that, that much worse. We don't know where it's coming from. They're in state orange now in many of the big cities. And I feel kind of secure out here. Although the irony is, the the one gentleman that came through that was headed to the oh yeah space through course, the, you're, you're you're in Port Townsend yeah so rather than right at the border yeah here. well <laughs> we know it's a border port and this can happen and he would have gotten through I'm pretty sure if had it not been for the Canadian customs that tipped him off pretty lucky on that one and they looked him over carefully and saw beads of sweat all over his face and he was a dead ringer for a. For a, a good target. He looked the part. Yeah. Luckily, they got him. Gosh. Scary stuff. Yeah. Well, let me get you unmiked. Just